Hello, and welcome to Matters Season 2. I'm Nefra McDonald, Affinity Partnerships Manager at Clio, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jack Newton, CEO of Clio and author of The Client-Centered Law Firm. Thanks, Nefra. If you're just tuning into Matters Season 2, we've been interviewing experts and legal industry leaders about the differences between the lawyer-centered and client-centered service models in legal, and why being client-centered is the key to success for law firms. Today, we're moving the conversation one step further. If you want some background on client-centered legal service delivery and why it's a necessary shift for law firms, you can listen back to the first four episodes of this season. In this episode, we'll focus on the impact that shifting to a client-centered model is having and will continue to have on legal. It's time to take a holistic look at the legal industry and talk about why client-centered lawyering can make a profound difference in the way lawyers serve clients, make a living, and enjoy their jobs. Our first guest today is Jordan Furlong, a legal analyst and consultant who founded the Law 21 blog. For this discussion, I really wanted to get Jordan's thoughts on what we call the latent legal market. This term refers to all the people who have a need for legal assistance, but aren't currently being represented by a lawyer. And it's a huge area of opportunity for law firms that are willing to tap into it by providing a better client experience. Jordan, something you and I have talked about in the past is the concept of the latent legal market, this massive segment of the legal market that has legal issues, but never sees those issues resolved by a lawyer. Can you talk about what it would mean for the legal industry if we were able to successfully tap into that latent legal market, address its needs, and maybe how client-centered thinking might help bridge that gap? I, I, yeah, absolutely. I can see two major advantages for the legal profession. I mean, set aside everybody else, but two advantages for the profession in uh, in, in, in coming to fully appreciate, understand, and respond to uh, the latent legal market. And, and, and one of those is professional because, again, we are a service profession. We're in the business of serving people's needs and making their lives better. And, and this is why I went to law school, and this is why the people who I like who went to law school went to law school as well. That is what should bring us here and what should keep us here. So the, if you will, social or professional opportunity for us is significant, and I think we want to push as hard on that as we possibly can. And there is also, uh, if you will, the, to my mind, less important, but, you know, that's, everybody's got their different priorities, the, the business side of it in terms of there are opportunities here from a revenue standpoint, from a profit standpoint, from a making a living standpoint. Now, I do want to throw a caution in there. Again, about 10 years ago or so ago, when I was giving presentations on this topic, I would sometimes be doing a slideshow and I put an iceberg up on the, uh, on the, on the slide. And I'll say, okay, icebergs, 50% above water, 85% below. 50%, that's where we are as a profession. We are dealing with all the issues up there in the bright sunshine. Everybody else is in the 85% underwater, freezing cold, holding their breath, hoping for a miracle that someone will come down and help them out. And I still think that is accurate. What I think, though, is that some people over the years, using that iceberg analogy, have made a bit of a leap to say that um, that 85% down there is as profitable or as revenue-oriented or as whatever as the 15% above. And I don't think that's actually the case. The That 85% below, in a lot of ways, looks very different from the 15% above. And what we really, truly need, I think, in this, uh, in this sector, in this profession, is to understand that 85% much more clearly than we do right now. And that requires a tremendous amount of studies, surveys, data collection, interviewing. Uh, it, it, on a scale that no single entity in the law, I think, is in a position to do. We, can, we can't keep asking academics to do this. We can't just ask underfunded foundations to keep doing this. We need to make this a profession-wide moonshot. But we have, because we have to appreciate that, yes, there are all sorts of legal issues in that 85% or, or possible legal remedies, which is the more important point, right? And to say, not all of these uh, potential remedies should be generated by a lawyer. In fact, many of them shouldn't be. Uh, not all of them even need to be dealt with immediately. There are there are a number of them that fundamentally register for the people who have them not as a crisis, not as a burning platform, not as something which is a real number one issue, but it's an annoyance. 
it's an irritation. It's like, oh, geez, I wish, you know, uh, this has been an issue for a while. You know, it's like that leaky tap you can't fix. It bugs me, but, uh, you know, there's no easy, simple way to, uh, to access a solution to that. What we need are easy, simple ways for people to access solutions to problems that are at the irritation level and above. Right, because if it's below irritation level, if it bare, if, if if someone has a legal issue and it doesn't even present an irritation to them, I don't think that's a priority for us. I don't think we should be worrying about that. It's irritation and above irritation to chronic worry to anxiety to my house is burning down. Right, that's what we need to be looking at. So we and and we need to appreciate that the vast majority of these will not require a lawyer's full-time intervention advice and work as we define lawyers right now. I do think that there are ways we can tackle this through the development of systems. Now, this is where my Canadianness comes in. Um, and when talking to American audiences, this is where the culture uh, break is, is the most obvious because I tend to say, this to me is an obvious slam dunk. This is what a government should be doing. Should be creating a national legal utility which everybody can access because we also have national broadband, but that's a separate question. Anybody can access a system where you can ask a question about your legal issue and get a good answer. And you can get a, a solution or remedy to your basic entry level kinds of issues. And you can envision something like this. You could actually build it for less than we spend on other things in, in our society and in this profession of questionable value, right? But you could take care of so many people's, even if you dealt with the irritation level stuff, that would improve quality of life. That would free up resources. That would free up opportunities for people and businesses and communities to deal with things. But we don't know where to start because we haven't studied that latent market. We need to know it much more clearly than we do. And, and, and I guess my last thought here is that that's going to be difficult for us to do in a way because a lot of us want the latent market to look a certain way and we want issues to be of a certain kind. And they're not all going to be like that. We need to be open to what the data tells us. When I, I, I ran a legal magazine for a number of years and I would give an assignment to a writer and they call back a week later and say, yeah, uh, so this assignment, the, the what you described to me as the situation, it's not that at all. It's actually very different. And I would say, well, then report on the story you're finding, not on the story that I thought was there, right? And it's the same thing. We need to deal with the latent market, not as we think it is, not as we might wish it to be, but as it actually is. And we cannot do that until we dedicate the resources and the effort to finding out what it is. That's not on the legal profession alone, but it absolutely is on, among others, the legal profession. It's a great perspective, Jordan. And I think one of the most important things you pointed out is the the tools we use to go and explore that late, latent legal market and attempt to develop solutions for that latent legal market need to almost by definition look very different than what's working for what's above the waterline, as you put it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's and it, the, we talk about a legal market and I do this all the time. I called my book Law is a Buyer's Market, right? So, you know, I'm as guilty of anybody as talking about this as a monolithic entity, but it really isn't just because in society isn't either. There are many different aspects and corners and elements of the legal services sector, the legal needs sector, the legal remedies sector. Maybe we need to think, start thinking about that more, right? Because again, we talk about legal services, you're still thinking about it from the point of view of the provider. I give you a service. I serve something to you. Right. But when you start talking about legal solutions and legal remedies and legal answers, now you're talking the language of the buyer, of the person or the entity that has a need, whether they appreciate it or not. And here's the last bit. Sorry, I, I, I overlooked this on the previous answer and I should have made this point as well. Hand in hand with this process of understanding the latent legal market, we have got to do again, talk about a moonshot, public legal education and awareness absolutely has to be revolutionized. People don't know what they don't know. They don't know in which ways the law affects them. They don't know in which ways the law threatens them or puts them in peril or puts them in danger. And they don't know the ways in which the law can help them out of that situation or any other. And once again, we talk about this divide between the providers and the receivers of legal services. We need to meet in the middle and say, let's talk about this entire process of using the law 
to make your life better. Because again, and I will hammer this point home until the day I stop working in this industry, that's the point. The point of the law is to use the, use the law to make things better for people. And if that is not part of any mission that we adopt in this area, then we've gotten off on the wrong foot. Our trajectory is misaligned and we're going to have to come back at some point and do this again. So it is, we, we, and, and, and you know what, what it really takes on the part of the legal profession is some humility. We need to appreciate, we don't have all the answers. We don't even have most or even half or a bunch of the answers. We got a, we got some pieces of this puzzle, but that's all we have. We need to find everybody else, every other stakeholder and gather up all the pieces and then sit around the table and say, how do we put these together? That requires humility for us to appreciate that we don't have all the answers. It requires an openness on our part to invite other people in to say, I value your perspective, even though you are a dreaded non-lawyer. And it requires initiative for us to say, this matters to us, even if we don't make a penny off of this. It matters to this. It matters to us because this is part parcel. This is the core of our professional duty. That is the animating sense the animating drive that I think has to be behind the legal profession's efforts in the area of the latent market. Wow. Jordan is always so good at laying out clear anecdotes. I can really connect with that image of an iceberg with the 85% of clients who really need legal help holding their breath underwater, waiting for someone to serve them in a meaningful way. It's a striking image, isn't it? But it's true. The legal industry is focused on serving the 15% of the legal market that's above the waterline for far too long. It's going to take a lot of humility, like Jordan said, to figure out how to shift the model to address that much larger 85%. So if we're focusing on legal solutions instead of legal services, how does the industry go about prioritizing the needs of clients when the focus has for so long been elsewhere? That's exactly what I talked about with our next guest. Charlene Theodore is a lawyer, thought leader, and diversity and change management strategist. Charlene is the current president of the Ontario Bar Association, and she's the first Black lawyer to lead that organization since its founding in 1907. I asked Charlene what areas she thinks legal associations, law firms, and lawyers need to do to meet the changing needs of the market. When you build better workplaces for everyone, we take into account building better workplaces for clients. And, you know, so much of the OBA framework for so long has really focused on innovation. And I'm so glad uh, to see lawyers embracing innovation, um, not just to better serve uh, their internal staffing needs, but to really serve clients better as well. I really think the key is that, you know, you cannot think about what your immediate needs are today, although everybody today is really focused on putting out the immediate fires in front of them due to the pandemic. Um, the law firms that are true that are truly of the future have uh, the resources and the staff and the great minds on their team to really think about what the vision is for tomorrow um, and how you can build better workplaces with a view of what a client's needs are in mind. Uh, that's actually why um, several years ago, the OBA started our Innovator in Residence program. We want to really be the home where innovation resides. Uh, and so we have an Innovator in Residence every year, um, focusing on a different aspect of uh, legal tech innovation. Um, and this year, our Innovator in Residence is focused on working with law firms to provide them with a host of tools that will help them better serve clients. So I'm really proud that we're a leader in that space and also really proud of the conversations I've been having with lawyers and managing partners, both on and off the podcast and really seeing these hubs of innovation in different firms, lots of pilot projects going on, um, you know, lots of test runs of new systems uh, in different practice areas. And those little hubs are really where innovation lies in the kind of traditional law firm private practice space. Do you feel like lawyers today are more considerate of the client experience than they were in previous years? Not only do I think that, I think that um, we are about to ramp up 
to a level previously never seen. Things were a little quiet in 2020, but the talent war is coming. The talent war is, I, I guess I should say it's here. You know, people are fighting over great talent. And I also think that coming out of this uh, pandemic, whether you uh, provide work for individual or institutional clients, our client base in corporate Canada in general is a lot more sensitive to different ways that service providers such as lawyers uh, can meet their needs more quickly and efficiently, but still with a human touch. And also a lot more focused on the value proposition of firms, right? And I think that when you talk about things like ESG, CSR, diversity and inclusion, if tech isn't part of that conversation and you're not showing clients that you're embracing this in order to better serve them, uh, again, you're, you're a few rungs down the ladder. And this is a... Uh... Obviously, an expansive question, but you know, I I wonder how do you think about a renewed focus on the client being able to help address the access to justice gap? Well, again, focusing on lessons learned uh, coming out out of the pandemic, and I, I focus on that a lot because. Um, you know, as I speak with you today, I just got my second dose this morning. Um, so clearly, and especially as the leader of the OVA, uh, how we're all going to come out of this as a better, more improved profession has been on my mind a lot lately. Um, I'm proud to say the OVA led the way in getting all of our courts online up and running on Zoom uh, within the first two weeks of the shutdown. And I think what we're what we're going to see, Jack, is that culture of client focus and accessibility, autonomy and choice is going to really be driven by the examples that we've seen in court um, and at our various tribunals over the pandemic. And so providing enhanced options for clients, uh, be, I know lawyers that are seeing, I was having a conversation with uh, OBA past president Colin Stevenson, and he said he's seen greater engagement from clients because they can access things electronically, um, you know, uh, getting into issues with clients that have specific challenges around cognitive hearing or sight abilities. It's just opened up the wor a world that for the most of the profession, certainly not people like yourself, didn't know was possible. Um, and so in, in spite of all of the, you know, some of the backlog that we're still dealing with in our courts and some of the kind of logistical issues that we're working on, I think that the overwhelming positive response from the courts to how it's able to meet client needs, how we're able to get things done relatively quickly, no matter what model we end up with. And I personally think it's going to be some type of hybrid model in the courts. I think that's going to have a trickle down effect. And, you know, the market is going to be the deciding voice. Lawyers are not going to be left with an option, you know, to have clients come into the building for everything. And quite frankly, they may not even be left with an option to always speak with their clients by phone, right? Clients may prefer to see your face. You're going to have to offer that. Another OBA project I'm really proud that we did this year was with our Access to Justice Committee. When I started my term, Jack, I really thought that this shutdown would drive us further apart, you know, in terms of such a large province, you know, lawyers practicing in the North, the lawyers practicing in Windsor. But what we were able to do is team up from region to region to do a lot of pro bono work. We had a tenant uh, helpline, lawyers across the province uh, participated in, and lots of other um, initiatives where we had lawyers from Thunder Bay to Windsor joining in, working together to help Ontarians all over the province. And so I think it presents a number of possibilities. And it also, from a bottom line perspective, because again, we're running businesses here, when you take out some of that infrastructure cost, right? And you replace it with the lower cost of investing in some of this technology, that is a line item that you can invest right back in your business, right back in your communities, right back in your employees. And so it, it's not a hard sell for me, but I'm of course gonna be a champion of really leaning into technology and using these new models to kind of protect some of the lessons and conveniences that we've learned and acquired over the shutdown as we kind of go into, you know, I don't know if you call it law 2.0, but you know, in my opinion, it's no longer a question of why we need to really adopt an innovative and, and tech forward approach in law. It's now a matter of how. Jack, before we move on in the episode, I feel like we should take a few seconds to tell our listeners about the 2021 Clio Cloud Conference. Sure, Nefra. The annual Clio Cloud Conference is the number one event for legal professionals to build their skills, make new connections, 
and bring new energy and ideas back to their firms. Conference attendees can learn during engaging sessions, network with peers from across the globe, gain CLE credit, hear from incredible keynote speakers, and have a blast with premium entertainment. This year's conference will be held virtually from October 26th to 29th. You can learn more and get your conference passes at cleocloudconference.com. That's cleocloudconference.com. Now, back to the episode. Jack, I have two big takeaways from what Charlene talked about. The first is, I loved her line at the end on what she called Law 2.0. She said, it's no longer a question of why, it's now a matter of how. I think it really is the time to talk about how to help firms better serve the full legal market. Absolutely, Nefra. And my other takeaway is that Charlene is right. The pandemic has spurred an innovative, collaborative, tech-forward approach into action. The Ontario Bar and Access to Justice Helpline project she mentioned is such a great example of this. We need to see more of this in the legal industry. Lawyers working together, utilizing technology to serve clients in new and better ways. It's a shift in mindset from what do we need as a firm to what does the community need from us right now? And that new approach is something our next guest, Tiffany Graves, has built her career around, especially when it comes to access to justice. Tiffany is an accomplished attorney, former nonprofit executive, and visionary leader with over 20 years of experience advocating for marginalized children, individuals, and families. She currently serves as pro bono counsel at Bradley, a large national law firm. I asked Tiffany how she thinks law firms have historically defined success and how that definition has contributed to the current access to justice crisis. It's an interesting question linking those two, but I think there are some real intersections. I think law firms have traditionally defined success as having a strong, consistent client base, a motivated and and, and talented, you know, roster of attorneys and staff who understand what the firm is trying to accomplish and appreciate the firm culture and are helping to really build a culture um, that makes people want to be at the firm and work for the clients and help the firm be successful. And what can we do to, to retain clients and also recruit and bring new clients and opportunities for the firm? Those are the types of things that I think firms have typically measured their success by. And How that contributes to the access to justice crisis, I think, is in some ways we can focus so much on what's happening internally that we sometimes forget about externally what's happening in the world around us. The positive side of that, I think, is that it does make firms think about what is their stake in the community? What is their, how are they viewed in the community? And that leads to ramping up of involvement in community efforts pro bono and otherwise. So I think when you're singularly focused on what's happening inside your doors, you can lose focus about what's happening outside. And that sort of contributes to the crisis in the sense that you're not mobilizing your lawyers to help those people in need who can't afford your services. But the hope is that the flip side of that would be as you're thinking about your success is being one of those markers for success is how you're viewed in the community is that you're finding ways to give back to the community through things like pro bono. So I think while it can be a hindrance to be internally focused, it also can be a help from a success standpoint if you're measuring your success by how you're viewed in the community and utilizing your lawyers and resources to support the people who live in the communities where you work and practice. This is a more holistic definition of success that you, you, you do a great job of advocating for, Tiffany. Do you see the definition of success starting to evolve in this direction for law firms? Are you starting to see some of this change on the ground in terms of how law firms do actually define success? I am. I'm privileged to be co-president of the Association of Pro Bono Counsel, which is a global organization of folks who do the work that I do on a full-time and sometimes half-time basis. And that is to try to, you know, mobilize the attorneys who work at our firms Uh, to do pro bono. And there has been a growth in the number of people who are in my position over the last five to 10 years. And I think that demonstrates some success in this area and recognition by firms that we have to find ways 
to be involved in our communities. We have to find ways to give back. We have to find ways to help address the access to justice crisis. You're seeing a whole lot more news coverage and some of the you know legal publications around what big law, for example, is doing in the area of pro bono. And I definitely think firms see that as a, a way to demonstrate their success and the impact that they're having in the community at large. When you look at some of the mechanical ways that law firms operate, and certainly with some law firms, the laser focus on billings, both overall and at individual partner levels. And can, can you talk about the interrelationship of that and the more traditional view of success and, and, and how the operating model for a law firm can actually evolve when there's a more holistic view of what success looks like? Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if we'll ever truly get away <laughs> from some of the more traditional approaches. And I think it's just going to take time. And as other generations step into leadership in firms, I think we're going to see law firms look vastly different than they do now. And I think some of that will come from people who do approach their everyday lives and their work more holistically. What am I finding meaning in? What do I value? And how can where I work feed into that and be a part of that? So I think we're seeing some of that. When I think about the, the summer associates we have coming into my firm and the new associates, they're coming in and asking, how are we viewed in the community? How are we giving back? Those types of things. They're asking those at the interview phase. They're asking those while they're, those questions while they're summering with us. And those are the future leaders of law firms. There will be a tremendous shift in the coming years in how we view law firm culture and how we view how law firms interact with the society at large. That is really going to shake the way things are now in terms of the traditional law firm operating model. That attorneys would be amenable to thinking about that now, that it wouldn't keep taking years and years for us to get there. But I think, like I said, for some, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If, if it's working for us and it's generating revenue and we have clients who consistently use us, then why disrupt that? Disruption can be a good thing and it can really end up generating more business for your firm if you're willing uh, to step out there uh, and really approach your work in more holistic ways. And I, again, I think those firms that are doing it and are who are having those conversations will end up being some very successful firms. And let's talk about the shift in client-centered thinking and, and the way that client-centered approaches might actually improve access to justice. Can, can you talk through how you see those two concepts connected and, and whether client-centered thinking helps enable increased access to justice? I think for just about anyone who has taken on an individual pro bono representation, for example, who took it on and with a mind toward increasing access to justice for a low-income individual who didn't have access to a lawyer, your focus in taking on that case is how can I meet the needs of this client, this individual client who lacks the resources to be able to pay what my hourly rate would normally be. And I think those are really good examples of sort of client-centered legal services. That's pro bono, really, in a nutshell. Helping someone with the expectation that person is going to pay from the jump, that's not happening. So your laser focus is on what is this person's needs and what can I do to, to help address those needs? There, there are layers of empathy with that per, what that person is going through. There are layers of really active listening um, to what that person needs and what they have experienced. I think about some of the domestic violence work that we do, for example, where you just have to give that person an opportunity to share his or her experiences as you think about what your representation needs to look like. And it's not, I'm the lawyer, you're the client, I know what's best, but we're a team here. And together, we're going to figure out the best way to approach this to help you resolve your legal matter. The long and short of it is, I think there's a lot that can be gained uh, uh, from approaching lawyering in a more client-centered way from the work that we do on the pro bono side. And it's a very holistic approach to client service that I think would benefits law, benefit law firms on the billable side as well. One of the things Tiffany is so good at is getting right to the root of the problem so we can clearly see the solution. I loved what she said about how pro bono work enables lawyers to tap into empathy, practice active listening, and connect with their clients, in large part because the lawyers aren't worried about billable hours. Instead, 
they're thinking about how they can best meet the needs of their clients. You obviously can't run a law firm doing only pro bono work. So let's talk about money for a minute. I think one of the fears of shifting to a client-centered model is that it might lead to a decrease in billable hours and therefore less revenue. But the truth is that there's just as much, if not more money to be made by serving clients in a more efficient and meaningful way. Instead of worrying about how many billable hours firms can squeeze out of clients, a client-centered approach enables the firm to serve more clients in less time, generating better outcomes and experiences for clients and generating more return business and positive reviews and referrals. All of that is great for a law firm's long-term health. And the opposite is also true. Going forward, the more that law firms prioritize the billable hour at the expense of meeting client needs, the worse that will be for the law firm in the long run. That's really important for lawyers to hear, Jack. And I think a really great example of that kind of thinking is the story you talk about in your book, where you discuss the differences between Blockbuster and Netflix. Blockbuster was a giant in the movie watching world, but its business model was built around getting as many movie rentals as possible, and particularly charging fees whenever customers returned rentals later than they were supposed to. Meanwhile, Netflix focused on a client-centered model that eliminated late fees and tried to make the overall client experience easier and better. Ultimately, Netflix created a market many times larger than Blockbuster ever had, even at its height of success. That's right, Nefra. And the same is true of the latent legal market. By shifting to a client-centered model, law firms can serve so many more people. To tie it back to what Jordan Furlong said at the beginning of this episode, law firms are only reaching the 15% of the iceberg above the waterline. The latent legal market is the 85% of potential customers who are waiting underwater, and all they want is for someone to offer legal services in an accessible, beneficial way that meets their needs. In our next episode, we'll start to really look at the practical steps law firms can take to begin serving this latent legal market by becoming more client-centered. I'm excited about it. In these first episodes, we've covered the why of client-centered lawyering. And now we can start getting into the how. Until next time, thanks to everyone for listening. And as always, a big thank you to my wonderful co-host, Nefer McDonald. Thanks, Jack. This has been a presentation of Season 2 of Matters, based on the client-centered law firm, the best-selling book by Jack Newton. Matters is hosted by Jack Newton and Nefer McDonald, produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and brought to you by Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider. Be sure to subscribe to Matters wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit us at clio.com. To read Jack's book, search for The Client-Centered Law Firm wherever you buy your books.